Hello everyone. In today's video, we are going to be talking about how trauma impacts the brain in children and teens. My name is Tammy Shimoon and I am a registered child psychologist, the co-founder of the Institute of Child Psychology. I am the co-author of the Parenting Handbook and the co-host of the Child Psych Podcast. And childhood trauma is something I'm very passionate about. And I've been treating children who have been impacted by trauma for about 15 years now. So I think what we need to understand first and foremost about trauma is it can be, you know, single incidences such as, you know, a car accident or a house fire, or it can be something that happens uh, that is highly stressful and threatening to that child over a long period of time. This could be childhood neglect, bullying, um, high conflict divorce, things like that. But ultimately, I think what we need to understand about the brain is that it is formed and shaped through relationships and experiences. I want you to think of the brain and how it develops as like a house under construction. Think of a multi-storied house. So there is say a basement, there's a main floor and there is an upper floor. And the way the house is built um, always relies on relationships with their caregivers and the experiences that our kids have wire that brain in several different ways. And so we're going to talk about how trauma wires the house and constructs a house that isn't optimal, if that makes sense. So if we think of the foundation of the house, the basement is the brain stem. This is what we, Tanya and I, my business partner, we call and co-author, we call that your body brain. It controls the central nervous system, essentially. It's fairly well intact when, when we're born. Um, and it controls, you know, our breath and our heart and, and things, things like that, um, immune system functioning. And then if we go on to our limbic system, that's like the second floor, the main floor of the house, that is what we would call our feelings brain. And that is governed by memories and emotions and relationships and attachment. Okay, so that's what we call the feelings brain. And the feelings brain, the limbic system, in combination with the brain stem, forms the downstairs brain. This comes, that reference comes from Dr. Daniel Siegel and Dr. Tina Payne Bryson may talk about this. So our downstairs brain is really in charge of the, they work together and to control the threat response, the fight, flight, freeze, or collapse response. Someone becomes stressed. It's in charge of, you know, in responding to something scary, we, our heart uh, races, our respiratory rate increases. So this is our, that stress response that happens. It's also very much rooted, that downstairs brain, that limbic system and that brain stem, the body brain are rooted in survival and relationships. So I want you to think about that. And then we have the upstairs brain, the cortical brain. So it's this part on the top of our heads and right behind our eyes. And that was what we would call our thinking brain. And that thinking brain is in charge of memory and speech, emotion regulation, impulse control, and Trauma basically skews how that this brain communicates, this downstairs brain, this upstairs brain communicate to one another. When we have repeated experiences that are fearful and we are not responded to in a certain way, um, we are ignored, um, our caregiver maybe isn't present there to keep us safe or to co-regulate us, the downstairs brain um, becomes very overactive it is used a lot, right? Because that's where the survival response takes place. That is where a threat response happens, that fight, flight, freeze, collapse. Our brain fights when something is scary because it's almost like when we evolved thousands of years ago, we had predators attacking us. So we needed to be able to fight or if our village was invaded. We have our flight response, which means we can escape something that's scary. We can climb up a tree or find a place to hide. We have our freeze response, which allows us to stop and pause to look for the nearest exit. What's the best decision I can make um, to keep myself safe. And you have your collapse response, which is kind of, um, I'm about to die. This is really scary. I don't want to feel myself getting eaten alive. So we go into a collapse response, which is, could be playing possum. So, so our, our attacker leaves us alone, or it can be a way to check out and to numb out. So we don't feel the sensations of being eaten alive. Looks very much like a freeze response, but this FFC response, fight, flight, freeze, collapse, is how the limbic system and the, so the feelings brain, the body brain work together um, to keep us safe. So we ignite, and this comes from what's called the amygdala. The amygdala hangs out in your limbic system and it is the part of your brain that's like the watchdog of your brain. It is, or the smoke detector of your brain. 
its job is to keep you safe, to survey the environment and say, you know, am I good? Is something bad going to happen? Am I safe? Do I need to go to my caregiver? And this amygdala, if it senses something isn't right or it needs protection or there's a loud sound or somebody's coming at me, it basically brings on the lower part of the brain, the brain stem, to protect us. We, you know, that's where our respiration increases and we get cortisol and adrenaline, these stress hormones that allow us to be stronger and faster um, and to escape or to fight off what's going on. So when that amygdala gets activated over and over and over through scary situations, um, a child not being responded to, to, they're left alone to regulate their own emotions, we start to see a brain that is specialized for stress. So the lower brain, the more primitive brain, the limbic system and the brain stem get overactivated and it's like going to the gym and only having leg day. And then we never work on that upper body strength. So if all the resources of the brain are sent to the, the brain stem and the limbic system, that lower brain, that child's brain is wired for survival. So even small amounts of stress will, will cause the brain to go into that FFC response, that fight, flight, freeze, or collapse, depending on the kiddo and depending on the situation. So these kids are very, very easily stressed um, because our, you know, I mean, our brain's number one job is to keep us alive. And this, these kids, their brains are really good about keeping them alive. Even when there is a false alarm, they're not actually being threatened in that moment. And part of the reason kids' brains um, go so easily into stress is that trauma actually damages how memories are created. So a child who's experienced trauma, those memories, what we call fragment, and that child can get triggered and that brain actually can't tell the difference between a, a trauma memory. It can't see a trauma memory and say, this happened you know, two years ago versus it's happening now. Um, that's a longer conversation we need to have um, about trauma memories, but that's basically what happens. That child has this sensation in their body, this flashback happens or a situation looks similar to an old memory and that child can't place that that thing happened in the past. Because this is what's interesting with trauma, um, we get a lot of stress hormones. Stress hormones come um, and they're, they're completely adaptive. We need them. We need, you know, cortisol in particular is released when we feel threatened. Now, a kiddo with a lot of trauma has too much cortisol and cortisol is released too quickly because the brain is primed for a survival response with traumatized kids. And cortisol in small amounts is, is okay but in large amounts and for sustained periods of time where it stays in the system actually causes inflammation. And it is basically carcinogenic and it tends to target two areas. The first is the memory center, which is the hippocampus, which is in your limbic system. And which is why children who have a lot of trauma have a difficult time learning from situations and time, time, we call time stamping memory, which the hippocampus does in partnership with your cortical brain. So it has a hard time saying, did this thing happen in the past? And then we see damage done to the cortical brain. So kiddo, kiddos who, who have a lot of trauma have a much smaller, um, less activated uh, prefrontal cortex, which is your thinking part of your thinking brain. So they'll have a difficult time with emotion regulation, um, speech, not always speech, but speech can be impaired, learning, um, reading other people's emotional cues and emotional states emotion regulation, those sorts of things. So school and social relationships are really, really difficult. Not to mention a lot of kids who have had trauma um, have had really negative experiences with trusting people anyway. And so they associate people whom are supposed to be their caregivers and taking care of them, that they associate those kind of relationships with pain. So I think what we have are kiddos who are primed for that fight, flight, freeze, collapse response, that amygdala um, has overdeveloped, the lower brain has overdeveloped, they're oversensitive to stress. And at this point, now we have a brain that is well developed for reacting instead of relating to other people and situations. So the brain's number one job now is always about keeping that child safe and about self preservation instead of connecting and learning and exploring and developing appropriately. So we have a really specialized large, overactivated lower brain and an underactivated, I mean, sometimes in some cases damaged because of cortisol, um, upstairs brain. And the brain also is skewed. We have a left and a right hemisphere. So two sides of our brain, and they're supposed to work together. 
the right hemisphere is all about emotions. It is about bodily sensations and kind of the big picture. And your left hemisphere is all about language, logic. It's very linear, a very matter of fact, and sees the small details. They're connected through something called the corpus callosum. Um, children who have had experiences of their caregivers not being attuned to them, protecting them, um, they're not responded to quickly or consistently. Um, what they tend to have is a right hemisphere that is very um, underdeveloped and isn't wired up correctly. So what we see and what happens is when we don't have a, a, a part of the brain that's well developed on one side, it's going to actually also impact the development of the left. So that's just like the lower. If we spend all our time in the lower part of the brain, it doesn't give the upstairs part of the brain resources to develop. It's the same thing when we see a right hemisphere that is not wired up properly and it's underdeveloped, it's actually also going to impact the left side of your brain. And what this looks like in kiddos who have had a lot of trauma is when they get emotionally um, dysregulated, when they feel threatened, when they go into the fight, flight, freeze, collapse response, they are either going to be cut off from their feelings or completely flooded from their feelings. There's like no in between for these kiddos. It's like all or nothing and they're over here or they're over here. And the last thing I want to say about trauma in the brain is that with that cortisol levels being so, so high, and I mentioned to you, it's almost carcinogenic in high amounts, um, that inflammation that, that happens can cause a lot of issues health-wise. So any kiddo who has really high ACE score, those are adverse childhood experiences, so high amounts of trauma, um, what we start to see is they have much more likely to have heart issues when they're adults, their immune system is compromised, they get sick a lot, they're more likely to have um, COPD, uh, they're more likely to have allergies, they're more likely to have autoimmune diseases, because what happens is stress, cortisol, basically affects how genes are expressed. If you have, a, say, a genetic marker for cancer or asthma, stress, particularly their cortisol, turns on this disease. At the same time, healing can actually turn off gene expression as well. And we call this, this is the study of epigenetics. So that's a really interesting part of trauma. So it does, it poses a health risk by compromising our immune system and turning on the presentation of diseases in our body. But at the same time, healing can also turn it off. So I don't want you to think that, um, that if you have trauma, your child has trauma, they're going to get all these diseases, but it puts them at a higher risk if we don't partake in the healing process. So if you want to learn more about uh, childhood trauma, if you go to the description in this video, um, we have a full course on childhood trauma. We also have another course on um, understanding trauma in the brain that isn't 15 minutes long. It is much longer. It's about 90 minutes long. So I'll have links to both of those. Or you can just subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we're building up our, our trauma videos uh, as we speak. So we hope you have found this helpful. Um, and we hope the Institute can be a resource for you in the future for anything uh, childhood mental health related. Mm -hmm.